When Jonathan and the people heard these words, they did not believe or accept them, because they remembered the great wrongs which Demetrius had done in Israel and how he had greatly oppressed them. They favored Alexander because he had been the first to speak peaceable words to them, and they remained his allies all his days. Now Alexander the king assembled large forces and encamped opposite Demetrius. The two kings met in battle, and the army of Demetrius fled, and Alexander pursued him and defeated them. He pressed the battle strongly until the sun set, and Demetrius fell on that day. Then Alexander sent ambassadors to Ptolemy, king of Egypt, with the following message. Since I have returned to my kingdom and have taken my seat on the throne of my fathers and established my rule, for I crushed Demetrius and gained control of our country, I met him in battle, and he and his army were crushed by us, and we have taken our seat on the throne of his kingdom. Now therefore, let us establish friendship with one another. Give me now your daughter as my wife, and I will become your son-in-law, and will make gifts to you and to her in keeping with your position. Ptolemy, the king, rep replied and said, Happy was the day on which you returned to the land of your fathers and took your seat on the throne of their kingdom. And now I will do for you as you wrote. But meet me at Ptolemais, so that we may see one another, and I will become your father-in-law, as you have said. So Ptolemy went out to Egypt, he and Cleopatra his daughter, and came to Ptolemais in the 162nd year. Alexander the king met him, and Ptolemy gave him Cleopatra his daughter in marriage, and celebrated her wedding at Ptolemais with great pomp, as kings do. Then Alexander the king wrote to Jonathan to come to meet him. So he went with pomp to Ptolemais and met the two kings. He gave them and their friends silver and gold and many gifts, and found favor with them. A group of pestilent men from Israel, lawless men, gathered together against him to accuse him, but the king paid no attention to them. The king gave orders to take off Jonathan's garments and to clothe him in purple, and they did so. The king also seated him at his side, and he said to his officers, Go forth with him into the middle of the city and proclaim that no one is to bring charges against him about any matter, and let no one annoy him for any reason. And when his accusers saw the honor that was paid him in accordance with the proclamation, and saw him clothed in purple, they all fled. Thus the king honored him and enrolled him among his chief friends, and made him general and governor of the province. And Jonathan returned to Jerusalem in peace and gladness. In the 165th year, Demetrius the son of Demetrius came from Crete to the land of his fathers. When Alexander the king heard of it, he was greatly grieved and returned to Antioch. And Demetrius appointed Apoll Apollonius, the governor of Colossyria, and he assembled a large force and encamped against Jamnia. Then he sent the following message to Jonathan the high priest. You are the only one to rise up against us, and I have become a laughing stock and reproach because of you. Why do you assume authority against us in the hill country? If you now have confidence in your forces, come down to the plain to meet us, and let us match strength with each other there, for I have with me the power of the cities. Ask and learn who I am and who the others are that are helping us. Men will tell you that you cannot stand before us, for your fathers were twice put to flight in their own land, and now you will not be able to withstand my cavalry and such an army in the plain, where there is no stone or pebble, no place to flee. When Jonathan heard the words of Apollonius, his spirit was aroused. He chose ten thousand men and set out from Jerusalem, and Simon his brother met him to help him. He encamped before Joppa. But the men of the city closed its gates, for Apollonius had a garrison in Joppa. So they fought against it, and the men of the city became afraid and opened the gates. And Jonathan, and Jonathan gained possession of Joppa. When Apollonius heard of it, he mustered three thousand cavalry and a large army, and went to Azotus, as though he were going further. At the time, he advanced into the plain, for he had a large troop of cavalry, and put confidence in it. Jonathan pursued him to Azotus, and the armies engaged in battle. Now Apollonius had secretly left a thousand cavalry behind them. Jonathan learned that there was an ambush behind him, 
for they surrounded his army and shot arrows at his men from early morning till late afternoon. But his men stood fast, as Jonathan commanded, and the enemy's horses grew tired. Then Simon brought forward his force and engaged the phalanx in battle, for the cavalry was exhausted. They were overwhelmed by him and fled, and the cavalry was dispersed in the plain. They fled to Azotus and entered Beth Dagon, the temple of their idol, for safety. But Jonathan burned Azotus and the surrounding towns and plundered them, and the temple of Dagon, and those who had taken refu refuge in it he burned with fire. The number of those who fell by the sword, with those burned alive, came to eight thousand men. Then Jonathan departed from there and encamped against Ascalon, and the men of the city came out to meet him with great pomp, and Jonathan and those with him returned to Jerusalem with much booty. When Alexander the king heard of these things, he honored Jonathan still more, and he sent to him a golden buckle, such as it is the custom to give to the kinsmen of kings. He also gave him Ekron and all its environs as his possession. Then the king of Egypt gathered great forces, like the sand by the seashore, and many ships, and he tried to get possession of Alexander's kingdom by trickery and add it to his own kingdom. He set out for Syria with peaceable words, and the people of the cities opened their gates to him and went to meet him, for Alexander the king had commanded them to meet him, since he was Alexander's father-in-law. But when Ptolemy entered the cities, he stationed forces as a garrison in each city. When he approached Azotus, they showed him the temple of Dagon burned down, and Azotus and its suburbs destroyed, and the corpses lying about, and the charred bodies of those whom Jonathan had burned in the war, for they had piled them in heaps along his route. They also told the king what Jonathan had done to throw blame on him, but the king kept silent. Jonathan met the king at Joppa with pomp, and they greeted one another, and spent the night there. And Jonathan went with the king as far as the river called Eleutherius. Then he returned to Jerusalem. So King Ptolemy gained control of the coastal cities as far as Seleucia by the sea, and he kept devising evil designs against Alexander. He sent envoys to Demetrius the king, saying, Come, let us make a covenant with each other, and I will give you in marriage my daughter, who was Alexander's wife, and you shall reign over your father's kingdom. For I now regret that I gave him my daughter, for he has tried to kill me. He threw blame on Alexander, because he coveted his kingdom. So he took his daughter away from him and gave her to Demetrius. He was estranged from Alexander, and their enmity became manifest. Then Ptolemy entered Antioch and put on the crown of Asia. Thus he put two crowns upon his head, the crown of Egypt and that of Asia. Now Alexander the king was in Cilicia at that time, because the people of that region were in revolt. And Alexander heard of it, and came against him in battle. Ptolemy marched out and met him with a strong force, and put him to flight. So Alexander fled into Arabia, to find protection there. And King Ptolemy was exalted. And Z Zabdiel, the Arab, cut off the head of Alexander and sent it to Ptolemy. But King Ptolemy died three days later, and his troops in the strongholds were killed by the inhabitants of the strongholds. So Demetrius became king in the 167th year. By his counsel, he stilled the great deep and planted islands in it. Those who sail the sea tell of its dangers, and we marvel at what we hear. For in it are strange and marvelous works, all kinds of living things, and huge creatures of the sea. Because of him, his messenger finds the way and by his word all things hold together. Though we speak much, we cannot reach the end, and the sum of our words is, He is the All. Where shall we find strength to praise him? For he is greater than all his works. Terrible is the Lord, and very great, and marvelous is his power. When you praise the Lord, exalt him as much as you can, for he will surpass even that. When you exalt him, put forth all your strength, and do not grow weary, for you cannot praise him enough. Who has seen him and can describe him, or who can extol him as he is? Many things greater than these lie hidden, for we have seen but few of his works. For the Lord has made all things, and to the godly he has granted wisdom. 
Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say, as with a voice of thunder, Come. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth, so that men could slay one another, and he was given a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I saw, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a balance in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius. But do not harm oil and wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I saw, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death. And Hades followed him. And they were given power over a fourth of the earth, to kill with sword, and with famine, and with pestilence, and by wild beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God, and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell upon the earth? Then they were each given a white robe, and told to rest a little longer, until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth, as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the generals, and the rich, and the strong and every one, slave and free, hid in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who was seated on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand before it? Today's reading from Sirach is the conclusion of a hymn of praise to God for his creation. Sirach begins his hymn by calling to mind the works of the Lord which starts the praise of God's creation, that ends with today's reading, the end of Sirach 43, and all that is made in the heavens and upon earth. Sirach comments on the great deep, that is the sea, which is filled with strange and marvelous works. The observation of the vast ocean and its multitude of marvels follows the review of the heavens, tracing the wonders of the sun, moon, and stars, and finally the mountains and storms. All of these wonders, however, are surpassed by their Maker. He is greater than all his works. Finally, the hymn concludes that the humble observation that many things greater than these lie hidden, for we have seen but few of his works. For the Lord has made all things, and to the godly he has granted wisdom. If God's works are astounding, so much more must God be himself. The, tra the tradition of prayer is not simply reflecting on God's words, but also, as Sirach shows us here, pondering his works. Both pursuits in prayer lead us to praise God. Do you often marvel at the great wonders of creation and the even greater wonder of God himself?